welcome everybody. This is the 17th or 18th, I'm not quite sure, in the series of brief webinars that we're bringing you from Black Dog Institute. This one's sponsored by the eMental Health in Practice project. Tonight we're talking about something that I think is probably really important to all of you at the moment. I don't know about you, but certainly I am seeing a lot of distress and despair amongst my Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander associates and patients in the wake of the weekend before last's referendum results. And I think that given how much distress that we're seeing, it's important to acknowledge that and we all need to have a clear idea of how to interact with the people that are suffering from that distress um, in the context of their cultural uh, beliefs about well-being. So rather than talk about the issues of the referendum, we're going to talk about social and emotional well-being and what that means to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. I'd like to acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as the first nation, first inhabitants of this nation. I'm on Gadigal land, the, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, so that puts me on the southern shores of Sydney Harbour. And my guest, Angela, is somewhere up in the north of the states in uh, Lismore. Uh, whose land is that, Angela? It's Ridgeable Wyabal country in the Bundjalung Nation. Okay. So we'd like to recognise both those mobs and everybody else in the country who identifies as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. And I'd particularly like to welcome anyone here tonight who identifies as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. It's really important that you're here. Welcome to you especially. Our learning objectives are to hopefully have you by the end of this session have a better understanding of what social and emotional well-being means and understand the framework that we we apply to social and emotional well-being and how it affects our clinical practice. And I want I would would wish that you would be able to use this new understanding to help you in your clinical practice starting tomorrow morning. I'm Jan Orman. I am a GP of many years standing with a special interest in mental health. I did a master's in psychological medicine last century. Isn't that interesting to be able to say that? And with me tonight, I have Angela Sheridan. Welcome, Angela. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Thanks, Jan. So I'm Anne Sheridan. I'm a Wiradjuri woman. I'm born and raised on Wijibu Wiable country, which is where I'm zooming in from tonight. It's also known as Lismore. Um, in the northern rivers of New South Wales, which is Bundjalung Nation. Um, I am a project officer for the WellMob website project, and I do the social media content creation for the website on our social media platforms. I am a graduate diploma student studying Indigenous health promotion through Sydney University, and that's got a social and emotional wellbeing overarching aspect to it. And I've recently returned from Canada where I presented on digital social and emotional wellbeing at Healing Our Spirit Worldwide Conference, which was my first ever trip out of this country and such a life-changing experience. So I'm really happy to share, you know, the little bits of insight that I have um, and what I've learned through my lived experience as well as an Aboriginal woman and um, working in the social and emotional wellbeing space. So apart from everything else, and we're really honoured to have you here after your recent international travels and celebrity appearances at international conferences. Ange mentioned that she works for WellMob, and I know that many of you will be familiar with WellMob, but just in case there are one or two people in the audience, let us have a look at this little video that will inform us about what the WellMob website is actually for. WellMob is a website to help our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander mob stay mentally strong and feel deadly. It's a digital library of online wellbeing resources made for mob from all over the country. WellMob is developed by and for our mob and brings together the holistic concept of social and emotional wellbeing to build connections to our stories about land, spirituality and ancestry. Search under the main topics relating to mind, body, mob, culture, keeping safe 
and healing. Or go to our training tab for health and wellbeing workers. Whether you're a health or community worker or just one of our mob, the WellMob website is your one-stop shop for digital wellbeing tools. WellMob makes it easy to search for apps, websites, podcasts, documents, social media, and videos that help our wellbeing. And it's not just about mental health. It captures our stories to connect us to country, culture, and our diverse communities. It's that easy. Search WellMob. Watch, listen, and learn about our Indigenous ways of holistic mental health and wellbeing. Go to wellmob.org.au and show your support with a like, follow, and share. These are the homes of ancestral spirits, and Wellmob walk lightly with gratitude and respect. Taylor said something very interesting in that um, voiceover. She said it's not just about mental health, and that's the point, isn't it, really, Ange, that social and emotional well-being in Indigenous Australians is not just about mental health. Talk to me about this quote from Mim Weber that you've put here for us to digest. Yeah, so as Jan just said in the video, um, social emotional well-being is more than mental health. Um, and it is a holistic concept, I guess, of the world around us and how it's interconnected to self. Um, so the quote that we've got here from Dr. Mim Weber, who is a WellMob website team member as well, um, really she explains why in why understanding social and emotional well-being is so important when you're working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander patients. So, you know, misdiagnosis and mislabeling of mental health conditions. Um, because the worker doesn't have a sound understanding of what social and emotional well-being is and the framework, and because that would really inform their interventions and strategies moving forward, and it could be more damaging than healing. Um, and it does, as we said, it does include mental health, but social and emotional well-being is a much broader, multi-dimensional, and strength-based concept. Mm -hmm. And immediately I'm thinking about misdiagnosis in terms of, of Indigenous beliefs that perhaps a non-Indigenous worker wouldn't know about where a psychosis might be diagnosed when in fact it was just visiting ancestors that, that um, were the issue for that particular person. So, I mean, that's a very obvious example yeah. and I'm sure there are other examples of that sort of thing. Yeah, and I think even misdiagnosis in terms of, you know, being just symptom-focused and not looking at the root causes of the issues that may be presenting, not having that holistic picture around the individual to be able to make those informed decisions then about moving forward. So let's move forward, Ange, to the social and emotional wellbeing framework that we've got a wonderful illustration of here. Tell us a little bit about this framework um, and how those external issues project into the self. Yeah, so the social and emotional well-being model recognises that the past practices continue to have effects on today's First Nations people. So in areas like education and employment, um, income and access to services, including mental health and well-being. And as you can see in the diagram, um, which is actually also a resource listed on the WellMob website, it takes into account the social, historical and political domains and how that affects um that inner circle, which is the connections that keep a person, an Indigenous person feeling strong. So connection to country, ancestors, connection to body and behaviours, mind, emotion, family and kinship and community are really important, as well as connection to culture and country. And they are our protective factors of health and well-being, the things that keep us feeling really strong. Whereas the outer circle of the social determinants, the historical cultural and political determinants, they're the things that can disrupt some of those connections as we've seen through past um, policies and things like that. Mm -hmm. so, so those are disruptors on that outer circle. Mm -hmm. They're also things that we can't do a lot about, aren't they, except maybe reframe them in our own minds. And yeah. Uh, you know, harking back to the referendum, that's what I'm thinking about, in fact, and how we can reframe that as something other than um, a nasty blow to Aboriginal people. Mm. So, I think I think it's also just deeply understanding how those determinants impact on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's social and emotional well-being 
you know, the intergenerational impacts that they have. And then more recently with the outcome of last weekend, you know, the ramifications that that's had on people's well-being moving forward. And even, you know, as our wider Australia picture, the presentations of racism-related stresses as well. You know, somebody said to me last week, and an Indigenous person said to me last week, I knew it was going to be no, so I'm really surprised about how distressed I am. So, mm. you know, it's it's interesting. Yeah. Um, it, it's a bit like I knew my mum was going to die, but I'm really still really upset about it. It's the same sort of response, isn't it? Mm. Tell me something. With these pieces of pie in the centre, all these connections in the centre to land, family, ancestors, et cetera, et cetera, is there one that's more important than any of the others or does it depend on the individual? I think that if we look at that, the pieces of the pie, as you said, as things that keep us feeling well and strong, there is always, for any individual, there's going to be some areas that are stronger than others, some areas that may need a little bit more work uh, to strengthen those connections. And I think being able to look at it as, you know, a holistic picture of an individual um, gives you a good insight as to, you know, what keeps them feeling well and strong and then what might detract from that as well. Tell me something, if you're, if I'm going to use this in a clinical context, how might I use it? Now, I know you're, I know you're speaking <laughs> from a... From a uh, <laughs> you said you weren't going to throw me any clinical questions. No, <laughs> I'm lived experience. I want you to talk about it from a consumer point of view. Yeah. How would it be if I, as your clinician, mm-hmm. pulled out a, a piece of paper with this written on it yeah. and said, how's all this for you? Uh, this is this is what I understand to be the things that are important to you as a as a, a First Nations person. Yeah, is that, does that resonate for you? Which bits of that do you think are important? Would that be a reasonable thing to do? I I personally would. I personally feel like you'd probably get a better response if you're able to unpack one or two of those domains a little bit further mm-hmm. with your patient and ask a little bit more. Um, broader questions relating to one or two of those domains Um, and having a a deeper understanding of that will, you know, allow you to be able to ask those relevant questions that are going to open up the conversations. I think sort of showing that would probably be a little bit confronting as a patient Um, Mm -hmm. and I'd probably be thinking, oh, so you've got this, but, you know, (laughs) why (laughs) talk to me about it? What do you understand about it? Let's, chat about it together but first of all let tell me what you know um and I think if you know the clinician or the practitioner is able to direct the question and be a little bit more like you know it, we know that kinship and community are really like strengthening factors for an individual so tell me a little bit about your family who do you live with um you know who's your go-to person when you're having troubled times or something like that. And questions like that will probably give you a little bit more insight as to who's there for that person um, for those things. So if you're asking questions like tell me about your family or tell me about your connection to country, then the the person at the other end of those questions will have a sense that you understand where they're coming from? Yeah, I think also too you've really got to... um, read the room. So if the person is coming to you in a GP setting and they're coming for antibiotics because they've got a terrible cough and they just want to get rid of the cough, they just want to get in and out, see you later, bye, they don't want to talk, that's fine. They don't need to tell you everything about themselves for you to deep dig further into their trauma. It's like, you know, lay on the lounge and tell me about your childhood, but it's not always like that in every clinical setting that we walk into. I think definitely if you've got the rapport with your patient and, you know, you've seen them over a number of years for different things, they're going to feel more comfortable opening up. But if it's early stages of that rapport building phase, then just take time to deep listen. And it mm-hmm. more often than not won't be on that first consult that a person opens up. It takes a little bit more time. Um, whereas if they're presenting in a, you know, a psychology session or a counselling session or they're coming to you for a mental health care plan so that they can get a referral to a psychologist, I think that that is a little bit more different and that probably opens up some of those conversations around 
some of these domains. Um, but yeah, definitely, you know, each situation is different. So reading the room mm. and gauging where your patient may be at. So if I can't have this sitting in front of me and use it as a crib sheet, I'm mm -hmm. busting to I'm busting to get it out there somehow. What if I made a poster of it and put it in the waiting room? Would that be yep. have any positive value? Definitely, I think. Um, and we know as. Well, I know as an Aboriginal person, but through the different cons consultations that I've done as a community member within the local health district, you know, making safe spaces for community and making spaces feeling feel more safe for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people does include having, um, you know, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander artwork or posters like this or other posters, health promotion posters that may be specific to us you know, in terms of visual representation of us and what mob look like and mob words, mob-friendly words. You know, this doesn't have written on it anywhere, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander social and emotional wellbeing framework. Mm -hmm. So I reckon if I have that on the wall of my waiting room, some non-Indigenous people might look at it and think, Hmm, that's interesting. These things are important to me. Some of these things are important to me too. Maybe I should be talking to the, the GP about some of those things. Yeah, or even just, you know, the GP having taking this Indigenous social and emotional wellbeing framework knowledge and being able to translate that across the rest of their patients mm. in terms of a holistic care model or a holistic view of the person. I think it works for everyone in that you know, regard. I don't think mental health professionals need to talk about this in relation to the way they work generally, but I do think GPs need to fill out the what they know about the, their patients and this definitely translates into, into the non-Indigenous uh, space um, with us wanting to talk holistically to our patients. Mm -hmm. So it really makes a huge difference if you know something else about the patient other than their blood pressure, you know, if you know, as you say, who they live with, who they're close yeah. to. Um, you know, whether they've got a dog or not, those kinds of conversations yeah. are very important. Whilst Medicare might frown upon them as not being strictly within the medical model, everyone who works in in medicine knows that knowing that stuff about a patient is very important. Yeah. Yeah. So it also, and that's what we're here for, applies to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander patients. So... Tell, tell me what you think about how keeping all these aspects of, of Indigenous wellbeing in mind is, what's it going to, how's it going to make a difference to the way we practice? Yeah, I think, um, I guess if you think of wellbeing then as a holistic view and concept and you layer that with um, being culturally informed and responsive and considered, so taking into consideration those social, historical, political and cultural determinants of health and then how they're connected to that inside circle of the wellbeing wheel. When you layer those things together, you're able to operate in a more culturally informed way um, and that could enable your patients to feel a little bit more culturally safe. There is always going to be a natural power imbalance between the healthcare system of which GPs are a part of and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people because of the, you know, historical factors that have happened over the, you know, past policies um, of history that, you know, only goes back to my parents and grandparents' age. So that intergenerational general mistrust is always going to be there. So I think that's where the um, rapport building and taking time to have those conversations and the deep listening really will strengthen that relationship between a practitioner and clinician and their patient. I, but, have yeah. sense, I have a sense that sometimes First Nations people might be afraid of the consequences of going to see a health professional, a GP yeah. or another kind of health professional. Is that right? Yeah, it's even, you know, for me, it is it is something that's always in the back of your mind um, because of past policies and practices that weren't that long ago, to be honest, and mm. sometimes, you know, are still ongoing today. So like fear of um, mandatory reporting and things like that, which we know that all healthcare workers and community workers have, um, and just where, like what 
um, triggers a flag or a something in the system, you know, that it does make an individual fearful about opening up and sharing. And, you know, that's where we do see underreporting of different things that may be experienced as well. Um, yeah, no, so that's definitely right though, Jan. Yeah. I'm, I'm translating what you're saying into um, don't be authoritarian, don't be judgmental, listen yeah. deeply, I love that phrase, and be reassuring. Yeah, and was- one thing um, a non-Indigenous drug and alcohol worker shared with me of how she operates a little bit more culturally informed is she's really open with her clients. She will explain to them about that mandatory reporting um process and you know what triggers a flag and what doesn't so that then you know she said that her client then is more relaxed and they're able to open up a little bit easier without having that fear of it you know is something that they're going to say or share going to you know potentially trigger those Mm -hmm. flags Mm -hmm. When you're talking about social and emotional well-being in the context of mandatory reporting, mm. what comes to my mind is the whole issue of um, aunties being okay mother substitutes in um, Aboriginal culture, whereas uh, white culture finds it difficult to come to terms with that. You know, that mm. I think that's one of the big mistakes. But that's an example of how yeah. I think we need to have that cultural understanding yeah. in order to to help people. Yeah, and have, knowing that, you know, the broader kinship system would have a grandparent or an auntie or uncle taking, you know, their niece or nephew or grandchild to the doctor. And it, mm-hmm. that's not unusual and that's not because there's something going on at home or the mother or father isn't able to when there's something happening, you know, on a deeper level. It's just that we rely on a, a broader support network and yeah. our extended families are so involved and hands-on that they, they definitely are like our aunties are, a second mum. So if you don't know, don't jump to conclusions. Find out what's going on. Yeah, and yeah. that's where that deep listening comes back to it and, you know, asking some really sort of, uh, gentle questions and yeah. Mm-hmm. On the slide in front of you, there are some um, training resources that Ange wanted to mention, particularly this sh- sheet, uh, the Understanding Social and Emotional Wellbeing sheet for mm-hmm. workers. Tell us about where we find the professional um, resources, Ange. Yeah, so on the Wellmob website on the landing page at the top, there's training resources. And if you go down the drop down to resource sheets for workers, there is a whole series of resource sheets because the Wellmob website now has over 350 resources on it. It can get a little tricky finding the right one and knowing, you know, which one might suit your clients. So we've kind of picked, you know, the top resources for each uh, specific topic. There's ones directly for clients, so on topics of depression and anxiety, sleep, and a whole other range like that. Then we've got training ones for workers, which does include understanding social and emotional well-being. Um, and on that top resource that you can see there, it's an interactive PDF sheet. So um, you can click on it and it will take you straight to the resource. Um, but that first one, the social emotional well-being welcome toolkit, It says for Aboriginal workers, but it's actually for everyone and anyone. And it really unpacks this topic of social and emotional wellbeing in a practical sense really well. Can I just say that that to everybody, if you haven't got your chat box open, it might be a good idea to open it because my colleague Caroline has put links to all of these resources in the chat box. And if you click on them and then set them aside for reading after you the webinar, I think you'll find there's a wealth of resources in those links that she's giving you. Uh, the other thing is, of course, we've got lots of lots of uh, podcasts and webinars that we've made made over the last little while, both on the Black Dog Institute site and on the eMental Health in Practice website. So these are things that that help us to get to know what's going on as far as social and emotional wellbeing is concerned. And, you know, one of the things I want to say about the WellMob site is 
it's where I have learnt most of what I know, apart from talking to people, most of what I know about First Nations culture. It is a wealth of information, lots of stuff about about um, uh, trauma and history as, mm. as well as about mental health. So, um, yeah. you know, there's lots of stuff on there and I do recommend that you go along and have a look at it. Thanks, Jan. Yeah, the resources on there, because you're able to, you know, watch and view them yourself, it's in a really easy to consume way. I think, um, I mean, I assume for non-Indigenous people, there's always that thing, oh, oh, I can't ask that. But this, you're able to find out your own information and be able to have a deeper understanding of, um, you know, some of the strengths around culture, community, kin, and social and emotional well-being. Mm-hmm. What's the welcome guide? Is that is that the one that you said that was good for non-Indigenous workers as well as Indigenous workers? Yeah, yeah, it is. So this one, it is for Aboriginal workforce. It's come out of the Kimberley Aboriginal Medical Service, but it's actually really great for everyone. Um, and it unpacks those domains that we were talking about in the social and emotional wellbeing framework. As you can see on here, you know, it'll say a short description, the positive and protective factors because social and emotional well-being is strength-based. But then it will also highlight some of the challenges and risk factors to that, which generally tend to lie out in that outer social, historical, political determinants space. To those of you who can't see the links, Caroline is about to put them back in again. They've been directed to in the wrong direction, so they're coming up now. You're not missing out on anything. There's one tool that I think might be really useful for you, and that is this Stronger You Wheel. Sorry about the typo in the title, but it's a Stronger You Wheel. And it may be something that you find useful for Indigenous clients and patients and non-Indigenous clients and patients. I notice it comes from Headspace, Ange. Yeah, so it's originally from Headspace in the Take a Step resource kit. Um, it is stronger you will, but even though it's headspace, it would be suitable for everyone, not just youth. Um, and you can use it as a practical tool in session to be able to start some of those conversations around, you know, what keeps your patient feeling strong and well and those strong connections that they might have um, and being able to guide that conversation. And then, you know, you use the inner part of the circle to talk about some of the things that make you feel not as strong. So some things that might weaken your sense of social and emotional wellbeing or disrupt how um, how you do feel strong or get in the way. That's, what, that's the words that we use. Some of the things that get in the way of you feeling well and strong. So the outer rim lists the domains that you're talking about. The wider section underneath those domains is for putting in the things that make you strong in those domains and the yep. centre is for the things that get in the way. Yeah. And you can see from the titles of those circles that it does match up quite well to that social emotional wellbeing framework. Gives you, mm-hmm. you know, good understanding into the patient's lifestyle and wellbeing. And mm-hmm. yeah, it's also listed on that uh, social emotional wellbeing sheet. I can think of a number of ways that I can use that and I hope the people in our audience can also think of a number of ways. I want to thank you very much, Ange, for contributing your expertise to this consulta- conversation, this yarn that we're having. Yeah. And, Thanks, and yeah. I, want, I want to thank everybody who is in the audience for having the curiosity to be here in the first place um, and Hope that you will be able to take some of what we've talked about tonight into your practices in the next little while. So we might just leave the room open for a minute while you're all getting hold of those um, links in the website. And I do encourage you to at least have a look at those tools. Um, You'll find much of it is quite useful, I think. 